as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is, a refreshing, is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even everlasting life. I think that nothing is more important in the family of God and in the church than having the blessing of God. The blessing on our lives, the blessings on our families and our homes, and the blessings on our congregation. So we ask God this morning to bless us as we come together, as we come together in one accord in harmony and unity before the presence of the Lord. We look forward to having a wonderful time of fellowship this morning. Uh, there will be some testimonies and praise reports, uh, meditation from the Word of God to stir your heart and inspire you from the Lord. And then also after that following, we have some wonderful little gifts that we'd like to give away this morning. And so we trust that each and every one of you got your, your little tickets as you walked in the door. But before we start, we're going to pray and ask God to bless us and bless the food today. I'm going to call on Brother Sam Matt if you just come down Needless to say, it's a wonderful privilege to be here. <clears throat> Amazingly, uh, I was concentrating and preparing to share with you from Proverbs 3. Um, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And, uh, uh, but as I was sitting there, I felt that I would rather want to share the reality of acceptance. And, I, and I'll tell you why. I think the most, for every one of us probably, we are driven to be accepted. Our struggle at school, our struggle in the family, if you were raised in a very solid home where your father and your mother were both affirming, uh, the problem may not be as big. But uh, in a home like mine, my dad was a drunk and uh, I never had any affirmation from him. I was the first born of six children and in fact my whole life long I never knew who I was because of that. I know it now, I didn't know it then. As a kid you don't know what's happening within your life or why you feel the way you do. But I was filled with anger and confusion and got involved in everything under the sun. You name it, I did it. Drugs, alcohol, woman, stealing, lying. My whole life was a lie because I didn't know who I was. Uh, this, today, some of you brought your sons with you, so I thought this would be appropriate to understand. Out of all the people in our lives, sons need affirmation from their father. Amen. Uh, women don't have difficult time loving their children mostly. They will give even if they happen to be somebody who is really career oriented or whatever, they still have this connection with their children. On the majority scale, there are always exceptions to the rule, I know that. But fathers, so many times we're absent because of our jobs, because of the things we do, because of our background, our circumstances, we don't know how to affirm. Some of us feel that it's unmanly to show affection to our sons, to our children. But I think it's the most important thing in the whole world to have your daddy put his arms around you as a boy and to tell you that he loves you and that he cares for you. Because we need it desperately in our hearts. We're not going to say it when we're trying to be the macho dude out there, you know what I mean? At least I never said it. But if my dad had just once said to me that he loved me and put his arms around me, it would have made a world of difference in my life. I was 45 years old before I, for the first time, heard my father tell me that he loved me. And he told me over the telephone when I was getting ready to fly out, I was at the international airport in Johannesburg getting ready to fly back to the States. I had just buried my mother and uh, I tried to see my dad in the 10 days I was at home. He was married to a stepmother I had then and after I buried my mother I called him and I asked him if I could see him. He hadn't seen me for a year and a half and I was living with my family in America. And this is what he said, let me get my calendar. I have one hour to see you on Thursday. My dad was retired. He was in his 70s. It gave me a very strong message to me. I wasn't important at all within his life. I'm talking about 45 years old. Children, the whole thing. 
Anyway, I, I was on the way to the airport that Monday to fly out and I was deeply hurt because of that situation. When I got to the airport, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, phone your daddy and tell him that you love him. You may never see him again. And so I picked up the telephone and I called him. This is what I said. I said, Daddy, I know I've been the lousiest son that you could ever have had. That I've disappointed you in every way. But I've been serving God now for 20 years, following and doing the best I can, and you still don't believe it. But I've only got one daddy, and it's you. And I love you, Dad. And I need you. And for the first time in my life, I heard my dad say, And Michael, I love you too. And I felt like a kid on the seat. That was by the telephone, and I cried, broken, for at least, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. <coughs> and a release took place inside of me. And I understood that desperately I needed to hear my dad tell me that he loved me and that he cared for me. Now, to set the basis for what I want to say, I want to go to John chapter 1. And uh, in verse 9, beginning with verse 9, it says this. He is the true light, referring back to Jesus Christ, who lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10 says, He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11 said, He came unto his own, and his own received him not, and rejected him. But to as many as received him, verse 12, to them he gave the power, the authority, to become the sons and daughters of God, to as many as believed in his name, who were born not of the will, not of, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. Verse 13. I love that text. And of course it's going to take a long time to lay it all out. So I'm not going to try to do an exposition of that portion. But I want to share some things to you. If you have a look at the beginning at John chapter 1. Beginning with verse 3 it says, All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And then he says in the fourth verse. That in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then in verse 5, and the darkness comprehended it not. So the writer places in juxtaposition light and darkness. When he comes to verses 9 through 13, he places in juxtaposition acceptance and rejection. I want you to know that acceptance is so important. Especially in our relationship to God. God is the embracing one. He's the one that's reaching out to us. He has his arms outstretched. I hear the, name, the words of Jesus in Matthew 11 when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the outstretched arm as he invites us to come to him. So that he can embrace us. So that he can accept us. So that he can help us to become part of his family. To be released from the things that have limited us and held us back. Uh, when I was finally um, appointed as the interim general overseer of the denomination, I went home to my church that Sunday to announce to them what was going on. And when I made the announcement, there was a tremendous sadness and groaning and weeping across the congregation. And... My associate pastor, a blind man from Nigeria by the name of Chuks Ezeguzi, he had been with me at that stage for 11 years. And uh, he jumped up and he said, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. Chuks is a little unconventional and things like that. I wasn't <laughs> expecting a question at that moment. And uh, he said this, If you could uh, think of one word to express your relationship with God, what would that word be? Now, I'm the kind of person, I'm a sanguine in my temperament. You know, hitch your wagon to a star, there you are. Take on more than you can do and do it. Bite off more than you can chew and chew it. Hitch your wagon to a star, there you are. That's my temperament. So I don't like to be put on the spot. <laughs> I'm not the philosophical kind who sits around thinking all the time as to the reasons of our relationships and all that kind of stuff. So he put me on the spot. Instantly I was angry with him. If I had the right, I would have embarrassed him publicly and told him to sit down. But he put me on the spot. And the moment that the panic rose in my heart, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, acceptance. And instantly.
instantly I knew that that was the one word that expressed my relationship with God. The word acceptance. Because he was the first one ever to really accept me unconditionally. Every relationship I had was based upon the fact that I beat myself to the top. I was a very physical, a violent kind of a person. I didn't win every fight that I fought, by the way. I lost more than I won. <laughs> but it was because I was nuts and I didn't care and because of the way I was that I got to where I went. People either feared me or they loved me. That's how we lived. But in God, I didn't have to do anything to impress Him. In fact, I had done everything wrong. And He embraced me and pulled me into the kingdom. He never asked me to do anything except believe. My dad was so disgusted with me. My dad told me, I'm telling it for your sake, Brother Robert, listen to this people. The people that you expect most to be affirmed by are going to be the ones that will discourage you and tear you down and will say things to you because, not because they hate you or they're against you, but because people just don't think. They just say things. The leader of the church in South Africa said to his board when I was getting on the plane to fly to America in 1973 to study, he said, see that man? He will never make it. Now, brother, now how do I know? Because eight years later, I replaced him, and his board became my board. And they told me what he said at that meeting. Oh, it was so encouraging for me to hear that the head of the church evaluates and judges people on the basis of what they see. What is wrong with us? Why are we so subjected as a God who is not bound by our conventionalities and our ways of seeing things? God can take a broken and have nothing like I was and make of his life something to glorify his name. I want to encourage you. I want you to know that. Don't live in God in your life. Don't you ever stand back. Now please, I'm not talking about pride. If you've got anything that's called pride, anything at all, get rid of it as fast as you can. Confess it to God because pride will hinder the process of God in your life. But humility, dependence, will receive his acceptance and his embrace and his affirmation. And he can do something. <laughs> My dad, on the way to the airport, I felt impressed that I need to go and say goodbye to my dad at least, hoping. And when I examined myself deep down in my heart, I wanted to hear him say, Michael, I'm so proud that you've made a decision to do something right. But it didn't happen. When I got to the house, I said, Dad, he met me at the back door with my stepmother. And uh, he stood looking down at me and I had some of these folks with me that were taking me to the airport from the church. And I said, Dad, I just come by to say goodbye. I'm going to America to study to become a man of God. And this is what my dad said. I'll give you six months and you'll be back in South Africa a failure like you've been your whole life long. That's what my dad said. Now listen, it went right over my head. Boom, because I knew, at least I thought it did. But the truth is that psychologically, it was in the back of my mind, it became the motivation for my success. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Years and years later, when I accomplished and got my degrees, in fact, I graduated with the highest award that that college ever gave. I didn't even know there was such an award, so I wasn't working for the award. I was working for my father's approval. I thought I was working for God's approval. And so years later, when I was pastoring the church, under whose ministry I got saved. Now I want you to know the night they gave me the going away party. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff in there, but they gave me a going away party and they sang that beautiful song, Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. And as they were singing that, I heard the Lord speak to me and say, You will pastor this church one day. Now you see, I was way underexperienced. I didn't have any clue. God told me that for me. 
I didn't realize that there's things that God tells you you're supposed to keep to yourself. <laughs> you're not supposed to tell anybody else. <laughs> and so I, I opened myself out to criticism because we had a very powerful pastor there who came after me even when I tried to drive over him with a pickup, blew marijuana in his face, cussed him, did all kinds of stuff. Week after week he came back. He was a powerful man of God. And so when they got through the singing, I couldn't wait to say, hey, the Lord just tuned me. I'm going to be the pastor of this church one day. And they laughed me to scorn. But that's exactly what happened. I became the pastor of that very same church many years later. And then the confident superintendent. And God in a miraculous way had accomplished what everybody knew. And was convinced could never happen. 1983 I was seeking the face of God. And he was dealing with me about servanthood. I was the most unlikely servant that you ever met in your life. Because I wasn't used to serving. I was used to taking. Just doing whatever I wanted to do. I manipulated people. I was a con man. Prior to my relationship with God I'm talking about. When I became a Christian all of those things didn't just fall by the wayside. Those things that were in my temperament. In my temperament I tend to be a, a manipulator. And God had to show me that manipulated, manipulation is below the dignity of a servant of God, of a man of God. Don't you ever manipulate anybody in the kingdom. Hallelujah. You lead them with love yes. and consideration. But manipulation, never. Because it's not the way. But I was into this. And so while I was seeking the face of God, He began to deal with me about servitude. And He was breaking, oh man, He was breaking me apart. And uh, this morning he'd asked me to wash the feet of our people and all those kind of things that he taught me as we went along. But one thing was happening one morning, five o'clock, I'm seeking him. And uh, I said to him, Lord, I was so committed. I just, I want to please you. And look at how I did at college, you know. I worked so hard. I, I had jobs. I did it all because I wanted to please you. And I heard his voice say to me, not to please me. And I said, What? And he said, you didn't do it for my approval. You did it for your father's approval. And the moment he said it, I knew he was right. I did it to hear my daddy say, you didn't come back a failure. You made it. You did what you had to do. And then I realized that God had taken that and used it as a motivation for my life. It's not what he wanted. It's not the way he wanted, but it's the way things were put together. God called us to be servants. I want you to think about this. In verse 10 of John chapter 1, the incarnation is laid out for us so beautifully. He was in the world. Who? He that was the Word that was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That Word, that God, was in the world. He was incarnated in the flesh. He came to that which He had created and had the right to own and do whatever He liked in. He was in the world. The world was made by Him. The very thing that He made, He came unto His own sin. The world didn't know him. The world did not know him. I want you to know the church is still, the church is full of individuals that haven't taken the time to get to know him. It's not about rituals and sacraments and all of those things are, have their place. But if they don't flow or if they're not motivated by an intimate Knowledge and experience with God, they mean nothing. Sacraments by themselves can't save you, they can't change you. It is an intimate, meaningful relationship with God that makes the difference. We have to know Him. I want you to know that sometimes we can sit in church for years and years, and it's not the pastor's fault, it's not the uh, necessarily the congregational style or anything like that, that's the problem. The problem is us. Because we're satisfied with rituals. 
and sacraments and things rather than relationship. Relationships are expensive. They cost. We can have arrangements with anybody. You don't have to pay for an arrangement. We can make an arrangement. You do this for me, I do that for you. This is how it works. Many marriages have broken down to that. An arrangement between husband and wife because they didn't want to invest the cost that it takes to have a meaningful relationship. I want to tell you that to enter into a relationship with God is free. He welcomes us. But to build a meaningful relationship is expensive. Oh, yeah. Because we have to be ready to lay it all out. What does it say? Trusting the Lord with all thine heart. What does it mean, all thine heart? In all thy ways, acknowledge Him. What does it mean? In all thy ways? I don't go on any trip. I don't buy a car. I don't buy a home. I do nothing without His direction. Because I'm a big bat. I cannot see. I don't care how sharp I think I am. I don't care how much experience you've had. You still don't know like He knows. We are subjective. Subjective to our education, to our culture, to our way of life, to the things we've experienced and what we think we know. But He is objective. Hallelujah. And above all of that, Sorry. and He wants to help us. But He won't force Himself on us. Thank you, Lord. He wants it to flow out of relationship. And only you and I are in control of entering into that meaningful relationship. Now I know with some Calvinists that's going to sit funny, especially if you're a five-point Calvinist. <laughs> and you happen to believe, you know, that uh, irresistible grace is just sincere, but I want to tell you this. If we do not open ourselves, if we do not trust in Him fully, if we do not surrender to Him, if we do not invest the time to build a relationship with Him, oh, we think because we're reading the Bible we're investing time. Maybe, some. But why are we reading the Bible? Are we trying to appease our conscience and to meet the standards? Or are we really taking the time to want to hear from God, to invest in the relationship. He was in the world, the world was made by him, the world knew him not. He came into his own. That word, that adjective that is translated, the two adjectives, same adjective that is used, Dios. And the first adjective is in the neuter. And it says he came unto his own creation, his own things, the things he possessed that he owned. And then the second Dios is translated as it's here in the masculine, by the way, and it says this, he came unto his own people. He came unto his own things and his own people. He came unto his own scene, into his own theater, into his own act. They rejected him. His own people, the Jews, those that should, those that have been looking for him, those who had all the scriptural nuances, all the prophetic words, everything in their favor, they rejected him. They received him not. I, that, that was, is devastating from a human point of view. But isn't it amazing that God wasn't devastated because he knew that that's exactly what he would do. Oh, do you know that the Old Testament is full of that same story? God coming to his people and his people rejecting him. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. And what does it tell us? That in the wilderness, after he had delivered them from Egypt and brought them through the miraculous Red Sea experience and provided for them, still they could not believe him. They rejected him. I mean, the story of the book of John from chapter 1 right through chapter 12, it's all about him being rejected. Chapter 6. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And in verse 60 they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And in verse 66 it said, from that day many of his disciples walked with him. No, no! While it's all one-sided, and I don't even have to think much or do much, I'll coast along on my eternal securities. <laughs> It's not going to change lives. 
It's not going to make you a son or daughter. It's not going to bring true freedom, true relationship, true acceptance and blessing, true love, true intimacy. Oh, I don't know about you, but I relish the intimacy in the relationship between my wife and I. I've been together with her for 37 years, but I had to pay a price to be intimate, to have a deep, meaningful relationship with her, and I cherish it. But the relationship I have with God is far more inspiring and, and uh, it's, it, it has such a, a vibrancy to it that it has a tendency to make me even a better husband and a better father and a better friend and a better minister. And it just makes me so capable. Oh, now if you only had verse 12, we would all say, how does this relationship come about? And we'd all say, oh, it's man's response. And if you only had verse 13, everybody would have to say, oh, it's only God and of divine order. Because it's not of blood. It's not of the will of flesh. It's not of the will of man, but of God. But the reality is a cooperation between us. God does the calling, the soothing. He's always the progenitor. It all comes from Him. But we have to respond. We have to respond. Our sons, our daughters in our families, what do you hear us say? I'm so proud of you, son. I'm so glad. And we can find ways to enhance them without being false. To affirm them, to encourage them. Families, wives to husbands, husbands to wives, on and on. But God does it with us all the time. It's amazing how many times I feel his pet as he's encouraging me. Fear not, I am with thee. Hallelujah. You're doing what is pleasing to me. Carry on. And feeling and sensing his presence. Praise God. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power, is what the King James Version says. But the word is exosia, we all know it's authority. You can have all the power in the world. You can be so strong that you can grab a bull by the horns and throw him on the ground. But if you don't have authority, your power is useless. You know that? I want to tell you, I love, I love it. The text, again, I know I'm rambling, but in Acts chapter 1, when I think of what he says in verse 7, when he says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has placed in his own exousia, authority. But ye shall receive power, verse 8. And here we've got the word dunamis. It's the authority of God. And to us he has given dunamis, power. And with his authority he has given us mandate and commission so that we can fulfill what he has called us to do. Oh, what a great God he is. Hallelujah. Yeah. To those who receive him, to them he authority to be the sons and the daughters of God. I'm not a son of God because the church says I am. I'm not a son of God because some pastor recognized me or did not recognize me. I'm a son of God because he has made me so. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And given me that authority. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to know he is glorious and wonderful in the extreme. Oh, how wonderful to be his sons and his daughters. Now notice, I want to point one more little thing and then I'm going to shut it down because there's just a thousand things falling into my mind right now. But notice the connection in verse 12 between to as many as received and then in the conclusion to them who believed on his name. It is possible to believe without receiving. It's possible to receive without believing. The two must go together. The one is not without the other. I want to illustrate that for you. My son lives in Cape Town. He came over for my other son's wedding last year. And he's coming over in April. It's Pennsylvania. April is cold, believe me. Snow on the ground still. And so I thought, I'm sure this boy, he's living in Cape Town so long, he has never lived in Pennsylvania, he's going to come over here without any preparation for cold. And so I went down to Walmart and I looked among the sale items because the winter things were on sale. 
and I saw a hoodie. My son likes hoodies. You know? And so I saw a nice hoodie there for five bucks. <laughs> I bought that hoodie. <laughs> now, what are you trying to illustrate? Just a minute. My son came and when he got to Pennsylvania, he said, Dad, it's cold. I said, boy, I've got the solution. <laughs> Dad knew I bought you a hoodie. Oh, great. And I took the hoodie out. I saw it was a flag. Hoodie. <laughs> and he took it rather reluctantly. <laughs> it was brand new. I was excited I'd gotten him something. He hated it. <laughs> because it wasn't plain. It wasn't his color. All that kind of stuff. So I didn't know it, but uh, he took it and put it in his uh, suitcase. He never wore it. I looked every day to see if he was going to wear it, but he didn't. And then I found out later, he went to Boston, to the home that I have there, where my daughter lives, and he got her to hide it away in the basement, so that he would never see it. <laughs> Let me illustrate. But he never believed in it, because he never put it on. He never made it part of his life. You see, it's possible for you to receive something, Never to believe in it. You see, what we receive, what we believe in, what we know is real, we take and make part of our life. Oh. Hallelujah. You have to make it part of your life. It's got to be part of you. They mustn't be able to separate between you and your Christianity. <coughs> I don't want to hear people say, he is in Christendom. I'm not interested in cursing them. There's a fella that is a servant of God. He's a child of the king because he believes it and he's received it into his life and made it part of it. To as many as received him, to them he gave the authority. God is an awesome God. You know that word trust in the Lord, trust. It's an amazing word. It's a derivative of faith. The Greek term for faith is pistis. I want to tell you something about faith in the English language. Faith in the English language is only a noun. A noun. Something you possess. Something you may have. But in the Greek, it's also a verb. You need, listen, we hear all about faith. People talking about you've got faith, you've got faith. Oh good, if you've got faith. But tell me, do you practice that faith? Does it have verb form in your life? Pistuos is the Greek term in the verb form for faith. Does it work in your life? Do you practice it or is it something that you hold like a trophy or a badge? Beloved, you are marvelous people. God has called you, put his finger on every one of your lives. But if you're going to be effective for him and experience him in all of his glory and majesty, you must believe and receive and sell yourself out to him in all your ways. I hear the devil as he's quoting to Jesus from Psalm 91. Jump off of the pinnacle of this temple. He will give his angels charge over thee. How he knows the scripture wisely leaving out to direct you in all your paths. God will take care of you. God bless you. Thank you. Lord. Let's pray together.